sociable weavers are in danger. There are only a handful of birds left. And they are on the verge of extinction. Um, uh, sorry, that, that's correct. Sorry, that was the wrong script. I'm sorry. Let's start again. Sociable weavers are not in danger. There are many more than a handful of them around. And they are not even near threatened. So why are there three researchers from Portugal? Two from France. And one from Switzerland in the Kalahari studying them. Because there's a lot more than meets the eye to the social system of these birds. Sociable weavers practice something called cooperative behavior, and more specifically, and the focus of this group, cooperative breeding. Rita Covers was the pioneer in studying this cooperative behavior in sociable weavers. We are very interested in sociable weavers because the, we think they have such fascinating behaviour. But the, the purpose here is not to study the species per se. You know, this is not um, a species that is threatened or uh, that needs that action of um, any type. It's, but it's an extremely useful model to understand cooperation a bit better. You see, these birds work on a helper bird system. At three years old, the birds are ready to breed. Breeding pairs have a couple of younger helpers to assist them and the chicks. Almost like a bigger sister, or in this case a brother, who helps with the task of raising the kids. For cooperation to work, every party must benefit somehow from this system. But the researchers here in the Kalahari are still trying to find out what the exact benefits are for these helper birds, while the costs are rather more obvious. The first cost we, we expect is uh, that you have to fly longer and more often to bring food to the chick. If you just feed for yourself, you're just going to leave, feed, go back to the nest and, I don't know, have a sleep. If you want to feed some chicks and they eat a lot, you really need to fly more often to find some prey. Why should individuals incur the cost? You know, Darwinian evolution tells us that uh, you should act uh, selfishly. And there are some selfish benefits in there as well, but we need to find out uh, what they are. And this is why Rita has been focusing on the weavers for over 10 years, and now has other scientists also looking into this. Early summer in the Kalahari is a very busy period for the sociable weavers, as this is breeding season. For the researchers, knowing what goes on inside the nests forms the basis of their work. The first question is who is the breeder, who is the helper, to, <laughs> to, to find out who plays which role. So to find the breeders, we need to identify who laid the eggs and who are the parents, basically. And only once the team has established this, can they monitor the effect of the helpers on the chicks. Sociable weaver nests are a favorite hunting ground for snakes. In particular, the Buomslang and the Cape Cobra. When a snake does make it through the angry attacks of the adults and into the chambers with the eggs or chicks, it's an eat-all-you-can buffet for the snakes. The unwanted visitors may also take a nap right there in the chamber. To minimize predation on the scientist study subjects, they wrap the tree trunks in plastic. But they still sometimes make it into the colony. It's not a foolproof method. When the coast is clear, they start by checking which nests have eggs. There is a new clutch in, of three eggs in 20A. Each clutch we found, we mark the eggs. The aim of this is to, when they hatch, to see which eggs give each uh, chick. The first egg gets one cross, the second two crosses, and so it continues then each little egg's weight is taken. 
They are put back into the nest and visual inspections determine on which day the first chick of the clutch hatches. This is recorded as D1 or day one. After this, a couple of checks are in place on certain days. On day four, the chicks are taken from the nest and weighed again on a very sensitive scale. Day nine sees that the chicks get their personal identification ring that they will keep for life. They are weighed again and a blood sample is also taken to determine their sex. Then they are passed on to Sophia to measure the amount of carotenoids in their beaks. So carotenoid is a color pigment that can uh, work as a signal to receive more food. She expects that the chicks with more yellow in their beaks are the ones to receive more food from the caregivers. The last day the juveniles are checked and handled is day 17. Once again, they are weighed and physical measurements like torso and wing length are taken. On this day, they receive color rings so the researchers can identify them once they fledge. We can know which bird is it. We can find the identification. We know it's a breeder, it's a helper, it's a chick of last year. Now the team will be able to see if this chick becomes a helper or not and monitor how it cooperates within the colony. After hours of observing the ringed birds, it looks like some helpers are more eager than others to do their jobs. To test this, the team put up cameras to film feeding rates in individual chambers. So to see the cooperativeness of the helpers, for example, to see if there is some helpers that feed more than other helpers. Their suspicions were confirmed. Nest or chamber 21 is a hive of activity with at least two helpers to assist with feeding the very demanding chicks. While at nest 55, there seems to be a lack of urgency in feeding the chicks. This helper's feeding rate is much slower than his busy neighbor. It seems as if these poor helpers can't keep up with the demand. And an increase in input means an increase in output. Inside the, this colony, they, they tend to form smaller groups. Uh, and those smaller groups are, have some chambers. Sometimes they only have one chamber. Sometimes they have several chambers. And in typical fashion, when it comes to interior decorating and housekeeping, it's the adult and helper females responsible for the upkeep of their own nests although some definitely have more talent than others. Because the colony doesn't have a body corporate to maintain the upkeep of the structure, this job goes to the males. Once again, adults and helpers share the task to look after the communal roof and outer walls. But just like in our own society, you get those who do their jobs diligently and then there are the others who merely pretend to work. We do have some understanding now of how some things work but there's a lot we don't know because you can cheat and let the others cooperate and do the work for you and so you, 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 you're still part of the group, you gain the benefit but you don't, um, you don't pay the cost and that would lead to the collapse of cooperation. So how is cooperation maintained? How is it stable? But one observation took the scientists by surprise. The helpers, they arrive with prey uh, to go into the nest, but if there's no one at the colony when they, were, when they arrive, they will usually uh, wait for other birds to come into the colony to then go into feed. So this, I mean, this can have different explanations, but one of them is that they want to be seen helping. It could also be because they want to be sure there are other eyes to watch for predators, you know, there are other alternative hypotheses. But um, this suggestion that they want to be seen helping is, is an interesting one. As most of the helpers are male, one of the tests Arno will conduct is to simulate a mostly female audience to see if there's any sexual reproductive benefit for the helpers. The scientist's work is far from over, as one answer only leads to 10 more questions, and their discoveries have far-reaching implications. You have cooperation at all levels of biological organization and from molecules to you know to humans to 
to our society. Uh, and some principles are common to, to all living uh, forms that, that cooperate. So it's very interesting because this can apply to, to our understanding of cooperation in other species, including uh, humans, ultimately. Obviously, with the Sociable Weaver study, we won't solve all the problems of cooperation in, in humans, but all these studies, they do bring elements that increase our understanding of how cooperation can be maintained, and that has extremely important implications for uh, maintaining cooperation in our own species. Yeah.